There is unease in many corners of the liberal democratic order. Anxiety that democracy is indulging in short-sighted populism, that economies are producing less, and that the benefits are clearly distributed disproportionately. Economist Ambiza Moyo shares some of those concerns and offers her characteristically contrarian analysis and advice in her latest book. It's called Edge of Chaos, Why Democracy is Failing to Deliver Economic Growth and How to Fix It. Time magazine called her one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And Dambisa Moyo joins us now for more. It's so nice to have you here. It's a delight to be I've here. Thank you so much. I've watched your work over the many years and I'm glad we could finally get you in that chair. Thank you. What are the obvious signs that you're seeing that we are, as you say, at the edge of chaos? So I would say that from an economic perspective, we have a whole host of long-term economic headwinds. Many of us are very familiar with them. Demographic shifts, um, the issues around health care and pension costs that are mounting, um, concerns around technology and the jobless underclass, what that might mean for um, higher unemployment in years to come, uh, issues around income inequality, the debt burden, productivity declines, worries about natural resource scarcity. This is a whole confluence of economic challenges that economists are deeply worried about, but these are long-term intergenerational challenges that uh, unfortunately are mismatched with the short-termism and the myopia that we see in policymaking and politicians, particularly in liberal democracies where the election process is so, uh, so frequent. More on that in a moment. Uh, economic growth and our sort of inability to do much better than, you know, one, two, two and a half, three percent over the last many, many years. Where would you put that on the list of problems today? It's number one, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, of course, I'm tainted as an economist, but I think it's critical for people to understand that in order for us to double per capita incomes in one generation, we need the world economy economies to be growing at 7% a year. Seven? 7% 7 a year. This is just mathematics. The critical problem with this is many of the emerging countries, and as you know, 90% of the world's population lives in the emerging markets. Those countries are growing far below that 7% target. Many of them are just coming out of a recession. Um, you have countries growing at around 1% or 2%, such as Russia or Brazil, South Africa, etc. These are countries that have over 50 million people. And it's, these populations are growing rapidly in many places in the world where we're simply not able to create the growth that is, is necessary. Give us the economics 101 here. If we, if we somehow managed not to have 2 2.5% economic growth annually, but 7 what would that mean to the planet? Well, for, first of all, it's, it's a mismatch in, in, uh, in expectations. People want to live like the average Canadian. They want to have a great home. They want their kids to have access to fantastic schools. And of course, they want to have amazing infrastructure and health care. Um, but in a world where we are seeing not only uh, economic growth slow, but in many places, contraction of uh, economic um, opportunities, this is a, a real problem in terms of jobs, it's in terms of living standards, and ultimately in terms of prospects for human progress. Let me give you the flip side of the argument. You tell me why I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, massive economic growth can also lead to very high inflation, very high interest rates, uh, overconsumption of natural resources, overpopulation, potentially more climate change as well. Uh, is that not something to be feared with too much economic growth? I wouldn't say feared. I think what, what we're suggesting is that we have to manage these processes. And actually, the, the, the public policy dialogue globally has already, um, in many respects, tried to adapt to that. I'm not saying we're at the place we need to be, but certainly in discussions around green growth and the need to create livelihoods and improve people's living standards, but with rec recognition and acknowledgement of the climate change implications, I think that that debate and discourse is incredibly important and is, is actually happening. I'm nowhere near where it needs to be. Obviously, this is something that has to be a global, on a global agenda. But I think that it's definitely brought into the, into the discussion to a point that I think is important. What do you think are the prime things holding back more robust growth rates? Well, for me, currently, I think that the political system in liberal democracies, which are the leading economies, um, I do think is hampering the debate. Um, by that, I mean the, a lot of the challenges that we're experiencing in the global economy today that I mentioned earlier are long term, and they require pragmatic choices, but also choices where there are some sacrifices to be made and trade-offs to be made between today's generations and future generations. But politicians very naturally court and cater to the, today's politicians because they want to be re-elected. That is the nature of the democratic process. And I'm arguing in this book that it is um, to the detriment of the global economy and ultimately to better livelihoods. But I am also offering a suite of solutions um, to actually bridge this. Which we will get to. Sure. <laughs> uh, we like charts here, so we're going to show a chart. This is from the International Monetary Fund, and this is real GDP growth 
across the world over the last three and a half decades. And as we can see on the left, you know, up and down and up and down, typical recessionary cycles. And then, of course, 10 years ago, the massive downturn, the Great Recession. And then as we come out of the Great Recession, you know, kind of flat. Uh, beyond the obvious downturn of 10 years ago, when you look at that, those squiggly lines, what jumps out at you? Well, I think that there's a hidden picture there. For first of all, the IMF um, in, in uh, a couple of weeks ago um, at the uh, World Economic, Out uh, they put out their World Economic Outlook, and they have actually forecasted that we're going to see a dip in those forecasts um, starting in 2020. So we're already starting to forecast the slowdown in growth. I think there's a more fundamental problem, which is not expressly um, uh, visible in those numbers, which is that um, it, it's around income inequality and the fact that the big gains that are being had are not being um, distributed e evenly or across the, the popu world's population in a way that we think or one could think is, is sustainable. Um, today, if you look at the Oxfam forecast or some of the data that comes out of many other civic organizations, the eight wealthiest people have more money than the bottom 50% of the world. Now, that might be a world that a lot of people think is sustainable, but um, you know, many uh, data points and historians have shown that those types of circumstances actually lead to a lot of political instability in the long term. We, we really should hit that on the head harder here because the fact is if you're a millionaire and I'm unemployed, our average income is $500,000 a year and gives, you know, gives the macro impression that things are just fine uh, right. when they're not. And uh, I want to follow up with um, I want to follow up with what the United States has done, uh, most particularly most recently, mm -hmm. in terms of the massive tax reform tax cut package that just went through. They have suggested, as a response to the challenge of slow economic growth rates, as an economist, do you like what they've done? So it's a fantastic question because we are living at a time where we, we as economists and public policymakers have actually tried two types of extreme interventions for income inequality. We have tried tax and spend, which is very popular in, um, across Europe, so higher taxation, but they use that to redistribute across populations. That has not helped to stem the tide of worsening income inequality. We've seen it get worse um, across those countries. But we've also tried the supply side intervention that you've just alluded to, keep tax rates low with the idea that actually people will start new businesses and actually with those businesses are hire more people and wages mean that people's incomes improve and it closes that gap. We've tried this before. That has also not helped to stem the widening of income inequality, the worsening of income inequality uh, over time. So frankly, I'm not that euphoric about what the long-term implications of the tax reforms are. If you look at the um, CBO, the Congressional Budget Office in the United States, their forecasts around the U.S. debts and deficits in the next 30 years are very dire, um, and rightly so. And there are more fundamental issues that need to be addressed than, rather than just cutting tax rates. I mean, I think superficially it's quite appealing, and I think many people, many businesses um, will turn around and say that's been good for the economy. But longer term, and again, this is the longer term issue, mm -hmm. and intergenerationally, how do we fund the government? How does the government actually fund itself in a world where its revenues are declining? Well, let's look around that world. You've told us about how Western European countries tend to be more tax and spend, and yes. there are issues around that. You have talked about how you're not nutty bananas about what the United States has just done <laughs> with its massive tax cuts. Are there other alternative economic models around the world that you see delivering the kind of prosperity that you think we need right now? Well, so again, you know, I probably wouldn't have written this book if there was if it was a clear answer. Um, I, I think the the fact that we have now got to a point where these extremes don't seem to be delivering um, means that we are much more open. Our economists should be much more open to other alternative models. One data point that I think is quite interesting is that the United States, a, dem a democracy politically and um, a market capitalist in terms of its uh, economics, has roughly the same Gini coefficient, which is the measure of income inequality, as China, which is the second largest economy, which has state capitalism as its economic stance and has deprioritized democracy as its political stance. So we have two diff countries that have completely different political systems, completely different economic systems, but roughly the same income inequality. So you know, when I myself have been able to travel to over 80 countries and people say, well, what model should I pick? Um, we care about income inequality. The answer is a little bit murky. The Chinese do have some innovations, um, such as you know, similar things to um, universal basic income, which has become very popular. But again, there, there are fundamental questions around social mobility, about investment in education in a way that actually has a significant impact that I think are being left unaddressed. Is there anything, though, about authoritarian capitalism that you think we ought to import here? 
Well, I, I think it's not about um, authoritarian, authoritarian capitalism per se. Um, I think it is about horizons. Um, it's about long-term horizons. And one of the proposals that I offer in the book is, should we be thinking about extending terms? The business cycles or the life cycles of, of, um, of an economy are roughly about five years, six years, and maybe a little bit longer, as we've seen in this recovery period. Um, and in that respect, the question, which I think is an important one to debate, is should we not then have political cycles that better match those economic cycles so that we can start thinking about these long-term mm -hmm. issues without being worried about having to win or, uh, or fight the next election. Countries like Mexico have a six-year term. Um, the president has a six-year term. In, uh, in, in Brazil, senators have eight to nine years um, as senators without having to face other elections. And of course, the, the point about authoritarian states is that they do have longer terms. Um, and I think that they there are- as long as they want. They, uh, well, <laughs> you know, to, in some respects. Um, but I think that the, the, the salient point there is that they are able to take a much longer view in terms of how these economies ebb and flow. And they are able to, to really take a good look at these intergenerational trade-offs. The downside of that is, if you've made a mistake as an electorate, you have to wait longer to correct your mistake. This is true. But Which I may will be particularly say, germane in your country at the moment for some people. <laughs> well, um, I will say that, that again, the, um, in the book, the second half is really about this suite of policies. And one of the things that countries like Singapore have, have introduced, which I think is quite interesting, is around pay to moderate and to manage that kind of thing. So specifically, they have higher compensation for their political representatives. In fact, um, ministers can earn 30 to 40 percent bonuses um, on top of very high rates. In fact, the Singaporean head of state has the highest. It's about $1.4 million in terms of their basic salary. You like that idea? Well, I like it because not only are they rewarding them for doing great things for the economy, but they also have punishment. So they have malice or clawbacks if they find that actually in 10 years' time, those policies that you put in place didn't deliver on education, it didn't reduce unemployment, or it delivered those outcomes but in a bad way. Would so you... it's very much similar to what's happening in the private sector. Would you worry about a minister of finance, let's just pick Canada, for example, who had bonus clauses in his contract to eliminate the deficit, but perhaps the economy, let's say in the middle of a great recession, called for significant priming of the pump. Well, I mean, I, you've got conflicts of interest no, all over that. For, you're absolutely right. But I think the, the point of my book is not to say, well, here's the, mm. here's the, the you know, two pills that you have to swallow. <laughs> it's to say, wait a second, there seems to be something wrong. We have voter participation declining. We have money that seeped into politics. This is not the democracy that we want to see. We want to see something better. We want to be judging our politicians based on outputs and outcomes, very similar to what's happening in the private sector anyway. So why should we not adapt some of the best things that are happening in the private sector, get rid of the worst things, of course, but really think about trying to improve democracy in, in a way that's, to me, urgent. The President of the United States today makes 400000 a year. Can that's you right. imagine the American population being prepared to pay somebody, you know, $2 million a year to do that job? Well, I think in the United States of most places, I think there would be appetite for that. I mean, I think Americans are very prone to <laughs> paying people a lot of money um, if they think you're doing the right job. Um, I think that they, what, they, what nobody likes around the world is people getting paid for underperformance. Hmm. And so I think that at, at a very minimum, it's, uh, it, there are, there's precedent, not only in Singapore, but other places around the world. There are things that are happening to democracies that I think are worth at least having a debate. There is a notion of public service, meaning you do it for the public and you make less money. You're not nuts about that, Well, eh? I mean, I think ultimately people care about outputs. They care about their edu the kids' education getting better, that future generations are getting better. If you look at the OECD research, this generation of Americans, for the first time in the history of the country, which is mm -hmm. since 1776, is going to be less educated than the previous generations. It's mm -hmm. never happened before. I think that that's something that's unacceptable. And I think Americans should be upset and, and outraged about those type of statistics. Let's go through some of the ideas that you have had, uh, which in your view would improve things. And let's start with mandatory voting. Yes. How would that help? So, of course, again, this is very much about um, countries picking what they think would suit best. There are about 20 countries around the world that have mandatory voting, Australia being one of them. Um, I think that it would target directly the, the, the sort of mantra of one man, one vote. Of course, it's, uh, it's not very PC today, but <laughs> that was the, the original mantra, one man, one vote. And we are seeing voter participation incredibly low. In the United States, it's about 50%. Um, at low incomes, it's around 30%, if not lower. That is 
unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. And essentially, we're ending up with a plutocracy by stealth because we have now only wealthy people really voting. And that's, to me, unacceptable. And so one thing that you could do is actually have mandatory voting where, or to be specific, compulsory voting, meaning you have to show up. Um, how you vote is, is your choice. But I think that those types of ideas are at least, again, worth considering. And the Aussies have something like 98% turnout right. as a result. That's exactly right. Hmm. Um, and I think it's important. Uh, we don't have this problem in this country because judges, believe it or not, judges make our electoral boundaries in this country. So there's no partisan monkey business right. going on. <laughs> but in your country, in the United States, it's appalling what's happened with gerrymandering yes. of boundaries down there. Yes. Could you end gerrymandering? Well, there are lots of cases. There's a case that just went to the U.S. Supreme Court from North Carolina. I think that there are innovations in, in, in train, nowhere near as quickly as I would like to see them. But again, I'm pretty optimistic that there are, there's precedent in Europe um, with the rotten boroughs. I mean, there are mm -hmm. ways that actually governments can be set aside and that there are, you know, as you just said, um, other entities or other agents can be seen to, to make fairer boundaries. And this, the, for people that don't know the term, this is, this is sort of monkeying with electoral boundaries in such a way as to make sure that all of your supporters end up in your That's constituency exactly and right. none of your opponents. Correct. And, uh, you know, it's <laughs> so basically a guaranteed win. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it, it seemed, I mean, it would seem to me that if you could figure out a way around ending that practice, you could have a much more representative House of Representatives and who knows, even presidency, and that might make people think that they had a bigger stake in the outcome. Well, that's right? why it's one of the proposals there you go. for discussion. <laughs> How about weighted voting? Yes. That's controversial. Tell people what it is and, and what you like about it. So weighted voting, and I think it's, it's only controversial if it's misunderstood. Okay. The idea of weighted voting is that ultimately you want um, citizens who are engaged. And I, I think it's critically important to make the point that, to me, the best types of democracies are the ones where as many people as possible vote and as many people who, are, who actually understand what's on at stake um, vote. So you want the, the voter to be incredibly literate. And I don't mean in the sense that they went to school. What I mean is that they really understand what the issues, what issues are at stake. Brexit is a great example. We know, uh, I think one of the most popular uh, statements post-Brexit was that it, it, the EU was the most Googled term. Um, mm. People didn't really seem to understand what they were voting for. That to me is unacceptable. Um, but we also, we, given that these two things need to happen, one, as many people as possible, and we want them to be as learned as possible, one of the things worth considering is weighted voting. And this idea um, is really already being road tested in places in Europe. It's the question of whether people who have more information around a particular sector or an industry should have a higher vote um, in a certain policy. So take an example of healthcare. Um, you know, do I really know what the best use of an extra dollar is in the hospital setting? I don't. But I would imagine doctors and nurses and people who work in, in the medical facilities um, all day long will know whether it's better to spend the dollar on health, on, on a bed or on new medicine or on, you know, an x-ray machine. And so their vote might weigh in more heavily than my vote because I don't, I don't know anything about that. And similarly for teachers, they know whether they need more uh, chalkboards. You can see what generation I'm from, but, <laughs> um, or they need to invest more in teacher training or in a classroom than the average person. So why wouldn't their vote count, count for more? And may I just leave you with one last vote, which I think was very apropos given the Brexit vote, which is this idea that if you think about people who are, um, you know, the, the young are going to face a much more of a future mm -hmm. with, the, with Britain under, after the Brexit vote outside of Britain, so uh, outside of the EU. And so the view was that younger people should have a bigger vote uh, in the Brexit uh, referendum than older people. Because they'll have to deal with the consequences for longer. Absolutely. So there, there's a lot of this type of thinking going on. And I think it's quite uh, appealing in a world where voters really don't seem to understand, uh, you know, myself included, um, mm -hmm. a lot of the sort of nuance and issues that uh, perhaps are critically important for our future. It's a timely issue here, because here in the province of Ontario, we're having a general election yes. on the 7th mm -hmm. of June. And we've had guests on this program in the past who said, if you can show up at the polls and name the premier, you get a vote. If you can name the premier <laughs> and the opposition leader, you get two votes. <laughs> if you can name the leader of the Social Democratic Party while you're at it, you get three votes. Weighted vote in that way. Is this idea, though, that it should only be one person, one vote, so deeply ingrained in Western democracies that, that this is a non-starter. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I'm an eternal optimist. I mean, there was a period not too many 
uh, you know, eons ago when people didn't believe that democracy should actually exist. We believed in an autocracy, uh, even in the Western, Western societies. There was, a, there was a much more recently, people didn't believe that everybody should vote. They thought women shouldn't vote. They thought certain minority groups shouldn't vote. But we managed to somehow convince um, the, the greater population that this was in the interest of, of society. What I'm trying to say here is that we've got a whole host of problems that we are facing and the democracy that we have in place. And as somebody who truly believes in democracy, um, I believe that the democracy we have in place is not working as efficiently as it should. And given its lack of efficacy, how can we improve it? And to, to, to my mind, I'm very optimistic that some of these are worth considering in a, in a more serious way. I'm going to read an excerpt from your book now on voter education. So if you yes. need a swig of water, now's a good time. Thank you. <laughs> uh, here we go. Sheldon, bring this quote up if you would. Voters must be nudged toward the right long-term policy choices rather than being swayed by personalities and short-term fixes. In its most radical form, this might extend to require voters to meet minimum requirements for knowledge of key public policy issues. We've talked about this thing, but I want to get very specific in my question here. There will be people in your country, for example, in the United States, and maybe some here in the province of Ontario. We have kind of a populist uh, right-wing conservative who is leading the polls right now, yes. and if the election were held today, he would win. The election is not held today. Uh, you know, who say this is all about ensuring that people like Trump don't get in. Is that what this is about? Absolutely not. In fact, this is about legitimizing the election, electoral process and the votes, regardless of the outcome. This is about defending Brexit, whatever the choice was going to be. Um, it's about defending whoever inhabits the White House and whoever is elected. We are now plagued with a lot of skepticism because people don't believe in the process. They don't trust that people are voting for the right thing. That, to me, is inherently bad for the system. But I think also what's, what's really important for people to take away is that we ultimately want to make sure that we, have, we get rid of the myopia and that we have a legitimacy um, for our representatives in a way that we believe um, actually works. There is yet another, we've talked about authoritarian capitalism, we've talked about our system here in the West, liberal democracy. There's another thing obviously going on, mostly in Eastern Europe, I guess, called illiberal democracy. Yes. People like uh, Viktor Orban in yes. Hungary, for example. Do you think we have anything to learn from them? Yes, I think that the, as a consequence of not doing anything, which is really, if we just continue to trundle along and say, you know what, this book and you know this worry about democracy is over, um, overheated, I think we could very quickly end up in those type of situations. As you probably are aware, um, about 70% of the democracies that exist today are illiberal democracies, whether it's in Zimbabwe or Venezuela or Russia, or as you, indeed, as you say, with um, Orban um, and in, in Hungary. And I think that kind of environment is, you know, is particularly uh, problematic because those, those illiberal democracies are indistinguishable from um, authoritarian states. That is not what the outcome we should ascribe to or we should think is satisfactory. And that's why I think it's important for us to step in and do something. I read this poll in your book, and I can't remember what page it's on, but it was a poll of young people who are... I mean, the number, to me, again, different generation, but the number was shocking of how low, how low the number was of young people who think that liberal democracy is the best form of government to live in anywhere in the world. It's a very low number of young people yes. polled in the Western world. That's right. How can that be? And, well, I think it's dissatisfaction with, with the way um, public policy is, is addressed in this country. I think people, they don't trust the executive. They see a lot of executive orders, which are very unilateral decisions being made by the president in the U.S., but also around the world. They see that the legislature is broken down. They see a lot of combativeness beyond the sort of combat that the forefathers might have expected, or, you know, which can be considered healthy. And they see that the judiciary system, certainly in the United States and elsewhere, is one that has two different systems. It has a system for people who are wealthy and or white and a completely different criminal justice system for people who are black and Asian and Latino and poor. And I think that they look at that and they say, well, there's something fundamentally wrong here. If we don't have the executive, legislature and judiciary functioning to a high level, then how can we possibly de de you know, de defend um, you know, the, 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 without those pillars? How do we defend the democratic process? Our time has flown by here, and I have time left for one more thing. And to that end, we had Yasha Monk from Harvard yes. University on this program not too long ago talking about the crisis in liberal democracy. Uh, let's play a clip of what he said, then we'll come back and Thank chat, you. okay? Sheldon, go. I'm not depressed by everything that's going on. I'm actually energized by it. Because when I was growing up, I thought those important debates we were having in politics, think about a topic like same-sex marriage, but they were limited stakes, big stakes, but limited stakes. We didn't think that our very freedom was a danger. 
Well, I think now it is. And that's frightening, it's scary, but it's also inspiring because it means that what we do now really matters. And unlike the citizens of China and Turkey and Venezuela, we still have a freedom to go and fight for our values. So let's do that. Liberal democracy still worth fighting for? Absolutely. Absolutely worth fighting for. It, you know, I, I, I believe that it is the system that can deliver. That's what was indoctrinated and in sort of a, in my mind. Um, however, not in its current state. Um, it is wounded. It's under siege um, and it continue to be. And I think the risk is that we could end up with much more populism and or much more plutocratic states. Neither of those ideal equilibria. And so we have to continue to fight to move the needle. More on this in Edge of Chaos, why democracy is failing to deliver economic growth and how to fix it. Dambisa Moyo, so good to meet you and Thank thanks you. for coming into pleasure. TVO tonight. Thank you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.